Okay, hello, my name is Doug Milliken. Uh, I was a sergeant in the uh, 4th Infantry Division during the Vietnam War and a reconnaissance platoon. Uh, this has been the third time I've addressed the uh, Freedom Committee as a whole. And um, so the first time I talked about uh, Operation Bente 1, which was the largest helicopter combat assault in the Vietnam War. Uh, second time, um, I talked more about daily um, living in the jungle uh, as an infantryman. And then over the years, doing uh, presentations at various schools, um, my presentation has evolved quite a bit. And uh, so this today, so that I'm not repetitive for anybody that might have seen my presentation from five years ago or two years ago, um, I'm going to cover a little bit different material, some of the same, but there's a lot of different. I'm going to cover the Bente One um, in Cambodia incursion, um, and I'm going to cover a little bit of the daily detail and a little bit more about my personal life. So when I retired, which was at the end of 2009, one of the things I spent my time doing in retirement was I took up genealogy, spent a whole lot of time uh, building a family tree, and I discovered I had a, a long list of uh, warrior ancestors that I hadn't known about. Um, one of the early ones was Lieutenant Thomas Burnham, who was my eighth great-grandfather, who fought in the uh, Pequot Indian War in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, back in the early 1600s. He fought on the side of the Narragansett and Mohican Indians fighting against the Pequot tribe, who was backed by the Dutch. So it was a fur trade war before America existed and before our Constitution. Uh, and in um, Ireland, I had a fifth great-grandfather, Alexander Milliken Sr., who, along with three of his brothers, fought in the Siege of Londonderry when uh, Londonderry was uh, attacked by King Henry. In England, it was one of those uh, Catholics against the Protestants deals. And um, um, Alexander Sr. survived. His three brothers did not. Um, one of his sons was Alexander Jr., who emigrated to America and settled in New Hampshire. And he ended up in Colonel John Hart's Crown Point expedition in the French and Indian War. Um, so there were four revolutionary patriots that were direct ancestors. The Alexander that I mentioned, the one that fought in the French and Indian War, he was also a patriot in the uh, uh, Revolutionary War. He was a little old for the fighting, but he was involved uh, somehow in a support um, uh, role, and uh, he was granted patriot status by the Daughters of the American Revolution based on his support. And that support came from the fact that had the uh, British won the war, he would have been executed in prison. So that's... And then his son, Robert Millington Sr., who was born in uh, New Hampshire, uh, was in the Rhode Island expedition. Uh, Private David Burnham, fourth great-grandfather in Massachusetts militia, and Captain Daniel Lane, a fourth great-grandfather, uh, was in Colonel Ichabod Alden, Alden's regiment and uh, was taken prisoner at the Burgoyne campaign. Um, a great-grandfather, Francis Almond Burnham, fought in the uh, Civil War in a third regiment of Rhode Island Cavalry, and my grandfather, Edward Mackinnon, uh, was in the Army Engineers and served in France during World War I. And then it came to my father, my father, Colonel Charles Bill, Burnham Milliken, who was uh, a West Point graduate, class of 1936. Same graduating class as William Westmoreland in Creighton Abrams. This is a picture of him on the steps while he was attending. Um, the highlight of his career was being the uh, finance officer for Lieutenant General George Patton during the Second World War, third, Patton's Third Army. So um, here, I, the deal I got off the internet, it's Chief of Finance is Lieutenant Colonel Charles Milliken. He reported, I believe, to the uh, Deputy Chief of Staff, Colonel Harkins, who reported to 
General Gaffey, who reported to George. That's the way the chain of command where George was occupied with military matters, but when it came to nuts and bolts day to day, he just dealt with his chief of staff, General Gaffey. We had two more chiefs of staff, and this list goes way down. It's a huge organization. Um, the Third Army, uh, when I discovered how big it was, I was kind of amazed because um, it shows that the Third Army consisted of five divisions, but they had 25 divisions attached to them. So that whole list starting at the bottom, infantry divisions, and our, those are all divisions that were attached to Patton in addition to his own five. Uh, and, you know, the, I was in the 4th Infantry Division, which is just one of these little divisions. So. Uh, it's quite a large organization. This is a picture uh, taken at PV England. That's my dad on the left. This was taken in early 1944 before D-Day. And then after D-Day, the uh, Third Army went across the channel to Northwest France and worked their way eastward across France and, and Belgium and Luxembourg to the Rhine River. Picture taken shortly after the end of the war, probably in Luxembourg, but it's my dad second to the right getting the uh, Legion of Merit Award. Um, this is the, uh, the American Cemetery in Luxembourg, which was built by Patton's Third Army. Um, interred there are the um, soldiers that were killed in the Battle of the Bulge and any other from the region that were also killed in action. As there's 5,075 men buried there and 317 memorialized <clears throat> missing in action. These memorials up on this stage like thing here are to the missing in action. So um, I mean, my dad never talked to me about the cemetery, but being as he was the chief of finance, I guess he must have financed it. Um, there's 130,000 American soldiers that were buried on foreign soil. There are today in 26 cemeteries in 17 countries. Um, the families were given the choice of either having their loved one's body sent home or being buried in an American cemetery in foreign land. And about 30% were buried on foreign soil. The rest were sent home. Uh, the U.S. no longer buries American soldiers on foreign soil. So for my classroom presentations, uh, I had a couple of them right around Memorial Day. So Denise asked me to cover a little bit of, um, you know, my, uh, what Memorial Day means to me. And uh, so I put a couple of quotes in there. One's, uh, there are two freedoms, the false freedom where a man is free to do what he likes and the true freedom where he's free to do what he ought, which causes me to think, gee, it's, it kind of seems like we're transitioning from a country who is free to do what we ought into uh, perhaps a false freedom. Um, so my Memorial Day thoughts to the students was this, uh, quote from me, fortunate, those fortunate enough to be born possessing protected individual freedoms, meaning constitutional freedoms, must be willing to fight to the death against tyranny and evil or else we lie down and let it roll over us, our friends, our family, and our future family, until there are no freedoms left anywhere, just tyrants and their subjects. So growing up a military brat, army brat, uh, I went to these, I went to school in these 10 different locations between first and 12th grade. Uh, the, the two in Maryland and the two in Virginia were when my father was stationed at the Pentagon but we also went to New York, Japan, Pennsylvania, and Maine. So this is, a, this is an internet photo of typical base housing, but I, make, I put it in here because it's exactly how I remember the housing in Japan, at Sendai, Japan, it's these duplexes. Uh, each duplex, downstairs is a living room, dining room, kitchen, and a bathroom, and upstairs is three bedrooms and a bathroom. And there's two of them together, and they're built into a U-shaped courtyard. So there's like two on the end and three down each side. And the whole center of the courtyard is all grass. So, you know, what I remember is all us kids coming out in the grass and playing all kinds of games and stuff out there. Great time. Um, it's me on the left, my two brothers and my sister. Picture taken. Looks like we're at the eighth where it's just after we left Japan. 
Uh, one theme that runs through my life is I always liked uh, racing things with on four wheels, and it started here in this picture in 1955. Me and a friend made a kind of like a soapbox derby thing. It's just coaster, no motorized or anything. And um, eight years later, they invented motorized go-kart racing, so there I am leading a race in Massachusetts. That stuck with me and until I retired long after the military. Um, I got inducted into the Army at the end of 1968 in Los Angeles. Uh, went down there and got sworn in. Um, we were measured, weighed, did all kinds of physical uh, examination, and then still in our civilian clothes, we were loaded on a bus and sent up Route 101 to Fort Ord near Monterey, California. It's a beautiful Fort Ord. Uh, we arrived at Fort Ord. Um, well, first, these are my basic training yearbook photo and my advanced individual training yearbook photo, both from Fort Ord. So that AIT photo there, you know, I look like a scared little kid <laughs> to me. You know, that two years later, I was uh, looking quite a bit different after two years of Vietnam. <clears throat> Processing in in uh, Fort Ord, again, we were run through the mill, measured and, and fitted with fatigues and equipment and boots and had her hair cut and um, all kinds of uh, uh, inoculations. I don't even know what they shot into me. Um, and it was none of my business. Um, they just shot us over and over again. If you're going to end of China, you're gonna have a lot of uh, immunizations. Um, this, is this is exactly what the uh, basic training setup was. I think this actually might be my actual, my uh, barracks would be the second one back here. And um, we would come out every morning in formation. We would go back to the rear to go get on trips, to go to training. But before all that, we would come out and run in formation and come out here to this field and do physical training. Um, And then the classroom was mostly outdoors, rifle ranges, different weapon ranges. And most of the training was done like in the lower left-hand photo um, where the um, uh, soldiers were in bleachers. And uh, the instructors, most of the instructors, I'd say probably all the instructors were Vietnam combat veterans. That's my uh, basic training photo graduation at Fort Ord. That's me on the top row, second from the right. Um, after we graduated basic training, uh, I was assigned to infantry, and so I just moved uh, down the street a little bit and uh, started up advanced individual training for infantry. Uh, at the end of infantry AIT, most of my platoon was assigned to Vietnam. They went to Vietnam as privates. Um, me and a couple other guys were assigned to go to Fort Benning, Georgia, to something called Non-Commissioned Officers Candidate School. Uh, at that time, during the Vietnam War, the Army had a problem in that they had insufficient uh, NCOs that were properly trained to be an infantry squad leader. The squad leader positions early in the war were all filled by the most senior available person. And that could be an NCO, it could be a spec four, it could be a private, a lot of privates even. But they hadn't had any training. So what they did is they took some of us, sent us to school for 12 weeks. Um, at NCO school, we did more weapons training, more physical training. But in addition to that, we did some leadership and uh, some tactics training. And then when you get out of there, they hang um, E-5 strikes on you, and then you're deployed to Vietnam. You're uh, qualified to be a uh, infantry squad leader. Um, this monument from um, Fort Benning, it shows there was 26,000 guys that, were, um, that came out of NCO school as either an A5 or an A6, and of those, uh, 1,100 and some were killed on action. 
So when I got to Vietnam, I was assigned to the 4th Infantry Division. When I got there, they put me in the 3rd Battalion of the 8th Infantry. And when I reported to their headquarters, they had an opening for me in the reconnaissance platoon. So I joined the reconnaissance platoon. There was one reconnaissance platoon per battalion. Um, it consisted of 28 to 30 guys divided into four squads. Three, Normally it was three rifle squads, one, two, and three, plus a headquarters squad. In this slide, I'm showing two as a machine gun squad and three as a grenade launcher squad. That's the way we were equipped for the Cambodia incursion because we were expecting heavy combat. Most reconnaissance missions, we were not expecting heavy combat. And so we didn't carry those weapons, but this is the way we were equipped for uh, Cambodia. Um, each squad had its squad leader, a sergeant, and each squad leader had a radio telephone operator. In a headquarters squad, we had a platoon leader, his lieutenant, a platoon sergeant, who a uh, senior career sergeant. Ours was an E7 most of the time. The radio telephone operator for the platoon leader, a medic, a scout dog handler, and a dog on occasion when we wanted it, we took them. And a Kit Carson scout, which was an ex Viet Cong soldier who had surrendered and been retrained to be a scout for us. Um, I recently found my um, platoon leader from Cambodia. It was Lieutenant Lawrence Johnston. Uh, I ran across him, and this is a screenshot from a PBS documentary one day I was watching, and there he was, so I uh, made this screenshot. Uh, I remember Larry the way he's shown in the lower bottom picture, um, and I, I contacted him about two months ago. There's Rex, our um, scout dog. The scout dogs were like a rented dog. There was a scout dog company at the base. And if we wanted to take a dog on our next mission, we would put in a request and they would send over a dog with a handler. Uh, the dogs would walk point and always walk with the wind in the face so they're smelling what's ahead of us, never with the wind from behind. That's not good. Um, but he was trained to pick up various scents. He could tell if uh, an enemy had cooked a dinner within the last 24 hours. And he could tell the difference between human urine smell and animal urine. So he would just walk, and then if he smelled any of those things he was trained to pick up, he would just stop. And, uh, and then we'd have to go forward and figure out what he's uh, hitting on. On the left is our Kit Carson scout, Kip. He was with us for a long time. We took him all the time. Uh, he, was, he was good. Um, when we went to Cambodia, I was told, Many, perhaps most, of the Kit Carson scouts didn't show up for duty. They didn't want to go to Cambodia. And uh, ours did. Kip showed up, and it's a good thing he did because we needed him there. <clears throat> so, this is showing our uh, setup at night in the jungle while we're on recon missions. Um, when I'm giving these uh, presentations in the schools, one thing I need learned that I have to impress upon them because it's not obvious to the students is um, the situation is we're living in the jungle 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The only exception to that is once in a while we would get a two day stand down between missions or in transit during a mission. But I, I would estimate that in a typical 30 day month, we spent 27 or 28 days sleeping on the ground in the jungle, never ever twice in the same place. So we're always on the move, always sleeping on the ground, except for uh, those stand downs and a seven day R&R &R that everybody was supposed to get once a year. So at nighttime, the uh, lieutenant would find a, what he thought was a good defensible position. And we would organize in a perimeter like this. Each of these oblong marks represents one soldier's sleeping position. Uh, average, I'd say, about 10-foot spacing, and if you do the math on 30 guys at a 10-foot spacing, it works out to about a 60-foot diameter <clears throat> circle. Uh, they were never a perfect circle like this. It, it varied depending on uh, what the terrain was like. Everybody wants to get behind a tree or a rock, and if they can't, they want to dig a hole and fill up a sandbag with a little dirt and get it up there to get some protection. But in a perfect world, you had a 60-foot diameter circle. You had the three 
squads were on the outside with the headquarters squad in the center. And then each squad would put out a couple of Claymore mines, that's what's depicted with the little wires going on, um, so that if the enemy had approached during the night, we could uh, blow a Claymore. The Claymore is an electrical device and you've got a manual clicker, so you can fire it on demand. Outside of that, we put um, illumination flares and, and tie it to a tree, run a very thin trip wire across and tie it down to a tree. And uh, then if the enemy approached during the night uh, and they touched that wire, it would trip an illumination grenade and we'd be able to see the enemy. Uh, those are set up very close to the ground, like a foot off the ground. Too low to crawl under. So each of those three squads during the night would have one man stay awake on guard in shifts, which worked out to about a 90 minute shift. Um, and so at any point during the night, there should be three men awake on guard and the rest are sleeping. Um, I put a couple of pictures in for the students to show them the variation in the terrain, but the majority of the time in the jungle, we're in triple canopy, which looks something like this very dense. Um, in this case, this is the point man for the platoon, and I'm in the second spot. And uh, when it gets too thick to move through, he has to pull that machete out of his pack and start whacking through the leaves. The problem with that is it makes noise, and if the enemy could be 20 yards ahead, and he can hear you whacking vines coming. Uh, so it's very insecure and dangerous feeling situation, but the opposite is equally insecure and dangerous. So that's occasion, on rare occasion, we would operate in the open. Here we are moving up a hill. And um, of course, the problem here is if the enemy's up on that ridge and they see that you don't have a lot of uh, uh, cover. And uh, so need, there is no safe feeling environment. Uh, we had chaplains that came and visited us when we were in um, at base camps. This is some small base camp. I don't remember which one. Captain Chapman, chaplain, would come in and set up his little uh, communion thing, and uh, anybody, you know, Catholics would come over and do a service. And they had a Protestant and a rabbi, and different would come. Uh, one of the things that we learned in um, NCO school that we didn't learn in uh, advanced in training was navigation. So we learned how to read a compass. Um, I like to do this in the classroom. We show this to the students. They seem to respond pretty, they're pretty interested in navigation. But I explain the compass and then show them a, um, a corner of a, a map, a topographical map from Vietnam 1970. And I always ask the class, like, does anybody in here know what these, what one of these lines represents? And usually there's zero or one student that is familiar with topographical maps. And occasionally you get one that there's family does uh, backpacking in the Sierras or something and they're used to them. But it's uh, lines of constant elevation. So if you look over on the right side, I hope you, can you see my arrow? Can you see my cursor there? Yes. Okay. So there's a, there's a little circle. And what that means is everything on that line is constant elevation. Everything inside the circle is higher elevation. So what this is, is this is a little, a small hill. And um, the, uh, the, the river is at the low ground, obviously. And anywhere where you see kind of a lack of lines, it means it's flat. There's not much elevation change. The elevation change from one line to the next line is 10 meters. So when you get down here, like in the lower left, where there, the lines are really close together, when you're used to reading the map, you, you know right away that that's impossible to climb. That's basically a cliff. So if you're down in the flat area and you're supposed to move over to this other flat area, you know you're not going that way because you can't get through. So. You know, the easiest way to go is go up the river, fall, you know, look for where there's not a lot of lines and work your way across and maybe you could get over here. Uh, the problem with that is if the enemy's up on these hills and they see your helicopter come in and they know you're somewhere down in that valley, 
they figure you're going to take the easy route. So that's where they set up their ambushes. So you can't take the hard route. It's not wise to take the easy route. So what you do is you take something in between that's a pretty hard route, but not a likely ambush path. Um, this one, there's two red marks is to demonstrate um, uh, there's an unusual looking formation here. And what that would be is a U-shaped hilltop. And if you look down here, there's a really odd looking thing. It's a long, skinny thing, but it's got two little circles inside of it. So that would be a Twin Peak hilltop. So if you looked out the open end of this U-shaped hilltop, which it happened to be a fire base, these lines, these dark lines are a 1,000 kilometers apart, so it's a click. So if you go out of the open end of that U-shaped hilltop, two clicks, and then look off to your right, you're going to see this thing. And here's the way that looks in real life. I'm on a helicopter here. We're approaching. Here's the U-shaped hilltop. And if you go out the open end, two clicks, and look off to the right, there's your, uh, your Twin Peak Mountain. So you learn to look at the, uh, the map and see 3D, what's, what it really looks like. Now, this helicopter I'm on in this picture, it's going to come in and land on the far side of that U right over here. And that's what that looks like there. So the um, artillery battery is set up on this LZ Susie, which is our battalion fire base. Um, and then there's, um, we supplemented the uh, guard on that base for a couple of days. And then we were sent out on patrol as we walked off LZ Susie on reconnaissance patrols out into that valley. Um, so I wrote a book. My book's called Testimony to Protect It, but it was really came about because of this book, which was 12 Days in May, written by Gerald Berry. <clears throat> and as he says here in the subtitle, it's the untold story of the northern thrust of Cambodia, an incursion by the 4th Infantry Division in May of 1970, and that was called Operation Ben Day One. Uh, even though I participated in it, uh, I didn't know that much other than what I could see in front of my face. I didn't understand uh, how what we were doing fit into the overall. So to me, reading this book was fascinating because it, it, uh, it told me what was going on around me. This book wasn't published until 2010, and I didn't find it until 2012. And then once I read it and understood the operation better, uh, it allowed me to write my own book, combining what I learned from Gerald Berry's book and my own experience into uh, testimony of the protected. Uh, this is a map from my book. That's a map of uh, into China. Um, shows the demilitarizing zone between communist North Vietnam and free South Vietnam. Uh, the 4th Infantry Division that I served in operated inside this blue rectangle in a place called the Central Highlands. It's a semi-mountainous area. Uh, the orange arrows represents the Ho Chi Minh Trail network. And so the uh, NVA communist troops came from North Vietnam into Laos and moved, worked their way south into Cambodia. And they set up base areas all along here, just outside the border of Vietnam. The purpose of those base areas was uh, to collect. They did some training there. They had hospitals there. They uh, had convalescent facilities there. And, um, and uh, in the um, Operation Ben Tay One, when we went into Cambodia, we attacked this little rectangle here. It's called Base Area 702. It's in the northeast corner of Cambodia. Um, it's kind of curious why the large, you know, Ben Tay One was the largest helicopter combat missile in the Vietnam War by U.S. force. And uh, it's kind of curious why the largest air mobile assault would be an untold story. And the reason for that is because when you, if you do a Google search on the Cambodian incursion, you're going to hear all about what happened down in the south. And that's because um, um, in the South, there was a couple of things. One, 
I'm going to go to the next map. Oops. Topographical map. In the south, there was this thing called the um, Parrot's Beak. It's a part of Cambodia that juts into South Vietnam. The tip of that peak is only 50 miles from Saigon. So it's strategically very important. Theoretically, American troops are not supposed to enter that area, theoretically. Um, and up here in the Fishhook region is where the communist headquarters was. Uh, they moved around. They didn't stay put in one spot, but they're in this region. And so when it became a possibility to go into Cambodia, the prime target would be to take out the uh, headquarters. Um, now, the thing that's unique about the South compared to us up North is it's, it's very heavily populated in the South and it's very flat. The Re Mekong River Delta comes down here. And um, because of the population along the border, a lot of the jungles cleared out and replaced with rubber plantations and tea plantations. And because of that clearing, it's possible to drive tanks and armored personnel carriers right across the border and into enemy positions. And um, so in the South, it wasn't necessary to go by air. You could go, they did it by air and on the ground. Up North, because of all this uh, mountainous condition, plus from our uh, staging area to base area 702 was a half an hour helicopter ride. So it was not feasible to do a ground assault in the North. Um, this is zoning in on our region. That's base area 702. When I arrived in Vietnam, uh, 4th Infantry Division was based here at Camp Anari. Early in 1970, it was moved here to Camp Radcliffe, which was a former 1st Air Cal base camp. Uh, at the time of the Cambodian incursion, we were doing reconnaissance up here in Bintan Valley, and then we were told to uh, get on a convoy and come on down here to Camp Radcliffe, take a couple of days to get ready and prepare to conduct a raid into Cambodia. So on April 30th, uh, Richard Nixon did a TV uh, presentation to the American people announced that the United States and South Vietnam would be doing an incursion into Cambodia. Uh, that got the peace protesters uh, all riled up. And uh, that resulted in the Kent State Massacre on May 4th, 1970. Uh, four students were shot and killed and eight were wounded by the Ohio National Guard. On the same day that this happened was the day that the uh, leadership of the 4th Infantry Division issued orders to its elements to proceed to the Cambodian border and to prepare, prepare to conduct a raid. So the day after that, May 5th, I took this picture, and that's um, reconnaissance platoon and some of the other, uh, a couple of companies headed on a convoy from Camp Radcliffe, headed west to a staging area near the Cambodian border. This is our staging area. It's a place called New Plains Ring. It's a high plains. Um, uh, the reason that place was picked is because New Plains Ring had been a uh, special forces camp in the past. It had been shut down, but it had a uh, uh, an airstrip, not in very great condition, but a, a paved airstrip. And mainly it was because it was accessible by road from the big base areas. So uh, they could run supplies up and down uh, the road, you know, helicopter fuel, ammunition, food, everything. Uh, so that's part of the uh, reconnaissance platoon. That's me in the back row with the glasses. Uh, on the left is my radio telephone operator, Floyd Lee. And this is, I think, the day before we airlifted into Cambodia. So there's some of our helicopters uh, just idling, waiting for the call. Um, the, the entire operation had 120 helicopters at our disposal. Um, and to give you an idea of the size of the airlift, it was six battalions. Each battalion is about 500 infantrymen, so it's about 3,000 infantrymen to, or, uh, to conduct a, an airlift of uh, infantrymen on Huey helicopters six at a time 
you would have to fill 120 helicopters four times. So if you can imagine what 120 helicopters looks like and then imagine them doing the full run trip. Now it took three days to complete that. And the reason it took three days was two things. One, almost every place that was selected inside base area 702 as a landing zone was hot and it was uh, a lot of anti-aircraft flyer in there. So, you know, the helicopter would have to go look for a safer site. That was one thing. Uh, the other thing was when these helicopters came back to New Pleasure Ring, they had to refuel and there's no permanent refueling facility there. So they refueled out of these um, fuel bladders that were laying on the ground. And, um, you know, you can imagine the helicopters would go in groups of um, about 20, was typical. But you can imagine if 20 helicopters returns empty, it takes quite a long time to refuel 20 helicopters out of one of these bladders. And um, so that slowed things down. Um, in, a, in the case of our battalion, each battalion set up a separate fire base inside Cambodia, and ours was called LZ Phillips. And in our case, it was the second day, and when the helicopters approached, uh, they were fired on heavily, and they bopped around to a couple of different locations trying to find a place to get in. When they got to this final location that we actually went in, the enemy set a trap, and that is when the helicopters approached, they held their fire. Uh, they waited until two helicopters were on the ground, and then they opened up. So the, um, the first helicopter was incapacitated on the ground. This is the remains of the second helicopter that tried to uh, escape, and it was shot out of the air um, with four crewmen, two pilots and a, a door gunner and a crew chief on board. Um, Three of the crew survived this crash. One door gunner did not survive. Um, this is a picture I took. This would be the second day of the entire operation. Uh, when it was our turn to go and we were headed to Cambodia, I was actually hanging my legs out the right side of the helicopter here, and I just raised my camera up over my head, turned it around, and reached across and shot out the left side of the helicopter. And that's what it looked like. So you can see. Um, new play terrain is, uh, you can see all the dust from helicopter blades and uh, trucks running back and forth. It was a very active place. Um, the first day before anybody went, the place was crawling with reporters. There was, uh, you know, newspaper reporters from the LA Times. I'd never seen a reporter in Vietnam, but they were, they were all over the place. There was some news about to happen. Uh, this is a picture I took facing into Cambodia, that's what we had up ahead. And that's the first picture I took on the ground at LZ Phillips. LZ Phillips was actually a potato field. They were growing potatoes to feed the NBA troops. Um, and this is the village that's just inside off the, uh, the clearing. This is where the NBA was living. And uh, Charlie Company chased them out of there. Uh, when they when they uh, fled, they took everything they could with them, but they couldn't carry everything. So, uh, you know, we captured and destroyed whatever they weren't able to take. This is a picture taken later in the week at Nelson and Phillips of what it looked like. This is a, an enemy defensive position, a very narrow trench. It's a T-shaped thing. There's a head on that. You see those logs up there? And the reason for that is the enemy would, um, if they were approached by a, a, a helicopter gunship, they would go up to the T and turn the corner for protection. And they'd just hope that that gunship didn't place a rocket right in the T. If they did, it was over. But that's really hard to do. Um, but because it was a half hour flight to get to Phillips and a half hour back, they didn't have a lot of fuel to be fooling around. So. The, the gunship would come and they'd have to expend their load of ammunition and leave. So the, the enemy would just go into that T, wait until the helicopter uh, expended its ammunition and they'd come right back out and start shooting. Um, this was a, a, a vacant 
pooch just inside the uh, tree line. You can see a couple of logs in the foreground there going over a trench. And uh, when we got there, we were told by the tactical operations command to go to that pooch and just wait until they figured out what they needed us to do. And we probably waited there a couple hours. Um, eventually, they figured out that the enemy was to the west and to the south. And so they sent three companies to the west and to the south. Uh, but they didn't know what was to the northwest. So our orders were, Recon, you go to the northwest and find out what's up there and let us know. So there we are at the hooch. That's me on the left. And this is when we're waiting for our orders. So this is the next morning uh, after an eventful first night. We took off and headed northwest. We were moving at a creeping pace because we had no idea what, what we were going to be encountering. Eventually, uh, after about an hour and a half, two hours, something like that, we came to the Ho Chi Minh Trail, big, heavy trail. Um, and our lieutenant, Lieutenant Johnson decided we would cross the trail and set up our nighttime perimeter on the other side of the trail because it was getting late in the day. And as we were setting up, he had an observation point in each direction up and down the trail. And when it got too dark to see good, he, you know, everybody was pretty much set up now, you know, had their claymores out, their uh, illumination flares out. He called in the observation post, and no sooner did he do that, but an NBA soldier came walking down the trail. <clears throat> we saw him at the same instant he saw us, and he turned and ran. And uh, in the time it took just to reach down and pick up an M16, a fire burst out, and he was gone. Because there was like a rise in the trail, so yeah, he just ran, and once he cleared that rise, he was protected. And um, so our first night was pretty anxious because of the fact that we knew the enemy knew exactly where we were. It was too late to move. It was too dark, and we were all set up. So it was a tense night. What happened was uh, four NVA soldiers walked into our perimeter. They were not on the trail. They were paralleling the trail. And I was woken up at 12.30 in the morning by my squad guard, and he was just whispering to everybody as he woke them up, you know, get up, there's somebody's coming, somebody's coming. And uh, you could clearly hear him because of all the dead, dry leaves. Um, and you could tell it was several people. The problem in a dense jungle like that is you can't, it's not a good idea to fire your claymore mine too soon because if you do, the uh, shrapnel is just swallowed up by the jungle and it doesn't actually do any damage to the enemy. So you have to wait until they're really close. Um, and so the, I was on the opposite side of the perimeter from the enemy, and the guy that blew the claim one waited until they were really close. When I say really close, I mean uh, definitely less than 20 yards. I'd say probably around 15 yards. He blew it. It killed one of them. It turned out there was four. We found out later. Uh, it wounded two of them, and then one of them happened to be standing behind a tree, apparently, when it went off because he was uninjured. And uh, they rolled behind the tree 15 yards away. And uh, and then we just uh, fired on the tree all night long. And we had our uh, Kit Carson scout, so he was talking to the Vietnamese and telling them that they needed to uh, surrender. They wouldn't be harmed if they came out with their hands in the air. And they weren't having any part of it. So it went on all night. And we waited until the sun started coming up, so we got a little bit of light. And then we, we uh, did what we call a mad minute. We just lined everybody up. And so they're behind one tree, and there's just hundreds and hundreds of rounds flying by their ears to scare them. And then the, uh, our scout told them, you know, come on out now. We're just bringing a lot of hand grenades back there, and it's over for you. So the one that was uninjured came out. And um, it turned out he was a, uh, a lieutenant and a political officer because before he came out and surrendered, he uh, he had a satchel with him, and he took out the papers, and he burned his papers. And the only thing he didn't burn was four photographs, one of Lenin, one of Mao, one of uh, Ho Chi Minh, and one of uh, Marx, Karl Marx. And um, 
I was glad he didn't burn those photos because it reminded me who we were actually fighting, you know, which was important to me. Um, so these are the two wounded guys here. This is we made some makeshift uh, litters and walked them back to the base camp. That's the same two logs in the back that you saw in an earlier photo, but right by that hooch. And that's a battalion medic, and he's patching them up. Um, so those two guys are on the right, on the ground, and then the guy on the left with his blindfold, his hands tied behind his back, is the political officer. Uh, the guy facing the camera, that's Lieutenant Johnson that I told you about, I found on a PBS documentary a year and a half ago. Um, so some of the facilities, these pictures I didn't take myself, I got them from the guy in Charlie Company, because we were out in the Northwest Quadrant, Charlie Company was burning everything around the, uh, the base. But this was a typical storage facility that contained bags of rice and corn and beans, and they just destroy it all and burn it down. Uh, this was a training facility that they burned down. It contained a wooden model of a Huey helicopter that was pretty obvious and was used to train uh, NBA troops on how to bring down a, a Huey, where to hit it, where the tender spots are. Um, some of the uh, weapons and ammo that were uh, found and destroyed. Um, they, we didn't find any uh, AK-47s. They took all those, but they left the Russian ICKS and you know whatever they couldn't carry. Uh, Russian SKS and other kind of low-end weapons. Um, so a few days later, uh, we encountered an NVA squad. This red line of numbers here represents the reconnaissance platoon. So it'd be first squad headquarters squad, second squad, and third squad. Uh, headquarters squad always was in the second position. And then throughout the day, we would rotate the position of the other squads. Um, the first squad um, bumped into a squad of NBA and a firefight ensued. This one was really close, I'd say less than 15 yards. And everybody scrambled behind a tree. Uh, we had one guy injured in the initial uh, fight, he got shot in the stomach, he was pretty seriously injured, and he did survive. Uh, my machine gun squad was at the rear, so we were firing across the front of our own guys into here, into the enemy. And it was a standoff because uh, when the enemy is that close, you can't really throw a hand grenade because if you throw it and it hits a vine or a twig or something, in the dense jungle, it can bounce back and kill one of your own guys. Uh, and uh, our, we had our grenadier that had the, the uh, grenade launcher was up in the first squad. The thing about a grenade launcher is the rounds don't uh, uh, arm themselves until they've traveled 30 meters. And that's twice as far as these guys are. So he's firing his grenades and they're exploding way back here. Um, so in order to get his grenades to, to hit something back here, he had to stand up behind a big fat tree and then just poke his grenade launcher out and plunk one and try to get it to explode back here and, and catch him on the rebound. Um, but it was going nowhere because um, everybody had cover. And so Lieutenant Johnston up in the headquarters squad here uh, called in artillery, I would say about 100 meters, 100 yards behind the enemy. And he got the rounds coming in there. And then he just, he called them five at a time. And then he, every time he called for five rounds, he'd inch it 10 meters closer to our position. So it basically put the enemy in a nutcracker. They had us a hard stop to their front, and then they had a closing jaw coming from the rear. And he just kept getting it closer and closer until the last rounds were hitting pretty close to them. And the, the shrapnel was whizzing past us, hitting the trees we're hiding behind. And um, eventually, um, it took them out. Um, when I finally talked to Larry a couple of months ago uh, about this incident, 
he was he was saying that he had estimated that there was seven of the enemy just based on it looked to him like there were seven based on the amount of fire that was coming where it was coming from um and he said when we were all done the tactical operations command told him to send somebody over there to count bodies and uh, he refused to do it he said the last time i looked at my paycheck i wasn't paid on commission we're done we're done here i'm not going to risk somebody's life for a body count so we we're done he had a the machine gun squad leapfrog to the point and then we continued on in the direction we had been going now during this whole fight we didn't know this trail was here we couldn't see it but as soon as the as we got to the front we immediately ran into the trail before the, everybody was even moving and while we were checking out the trail an nba soldier came down the trail casually and uh, we took him out um, it's pretty amazing to me that an nba soldier would be casually walking down a trail where there's just been a major battle because not only was there a major battle with 86 rounds of artillery fired on this spot but we had had a medevac helicopter come in and evacuate that injured soldier so there was a, a medevac helicopter hovering over this area for it must have been at least 10 minutes to get to get him out and uh, yet there's a guy walking through there I, I don't think he was the brightest soldier um, so uh, when it was time to go um, we were told to find a, uh, a pickup zone to be lifted out of Cambodia this is what we picked we found a uh, a sandbar at the bend in a river and uh, we first were on the wrong side of the river we had to cross it <clears throat> and um, and then we called for helicopters and they landed one at a time on that space and picked us up and, and, uh, and we left Cambodia when we flew out of Cambodia we flew right over LZ Phillips and that's a picture I took of LZ Phillips that very first picture I took was taken right out here and that hooch where we were waiting was inside this tree line here the um, three uh, line companies went west and south and the recon platoon was up here in the northwest that's where we spent our time these two areas here are areas that the nba was clearing out for additional um, agricultural land they felled the trees and that's why it's kind of dark looking the trunks are still laying out all over and they haven't got them out of there yet so on the whole uh, operation, Operation Ventil One up north, we had 46 uh, U.S. casualties killed in action, 118 wounded. The NBA, we had 212 confirmed killed, um, plus whatever the B-52s were able to kill before the operation began. Uh, we have no way of knowing how many wounded, uh, but typically for uh, usually there's about five wounded for every killed, so there's probably close to a thousand wounded NBA. And seven prisoners were taken, four by the Arvin in the south part of Base Area 702 and three by the Recon team. So items destroyed and captured in Operation Vente 1, uh, 550 tons of rice, a lot of weapons, 9,000 rounds of ammo, uh, gas mask uh, over 2,000 hooches and huts burned and 450 bunkers destroyed there was two hospitals uncovered one of which contained an x-ray machine uh, so when i wrote my book one thing i did is i put i did an epilogue and, in, and my intent was i wanted to learn something about an nba soldier something personal I wanted to learn something about a Viet Cong soldier, and I wanted to learn something about an Arvin soldier. I went on a hunt, and I was able to find a great book uh, uh, by an NBA soldier. He was actually had been an English teacher before he was drafted into the North Vietnamese Army, so he spoke English. He didn't write the book, but he did write a, uh, he kept a journal for nine years that he was in combat in the Northern, in I Corps, in uh, Vietnam. And uh, he met a, long after the war he met a former marine who went back to vietnam many times and uh, that marine spoke vietnamese and they both spoke french english and vietnamese so they could communicate really well and um, this vietnamese soldier asked him if he would he couldn't publish his book in vietnam because the government wouldn't allow it 
but he said, why don't you take my journals home to Florida and translate it and publish a book in American? And he did. And so I read it. It was fascinating to me to hear what, from an NBA soldier, kind of what he went through. They went through hell. They went up through absolute hell. Then the uh, VC that I, I read a book by a guy that was actually the uh, Minister of Justice for the Viet Cong, but he was... Uh, he was uh, in he was in the in that uh, headquarters area during down by the uh, fish hook that I talked about during the uh, Cambodian Cambodian incursion, and um, he talked about where he was during that and where he went when the incursion happened. It was pretty fascinating. Uh, both of those guys sent their children to college in the United States. American universities were willing to give full ride scholarships to uh, children of NBA and VC soldiers. Um, some of them. Um, and then the third one was an Arvin soldier, and that's this guy here, Long Dome. He was a uh, helicopter pilot for the Arvin. He grew up near Saigon and he was drafted into the uh, uh, South Vietnamese Air Force when he was a teenager. Uh, met and married his wife then, and he was sent to the United States to learn how to fly Hueys. Uh, he went to Fort Walters and then he went to uh, uh, Hunter, uh, some air some, uh, base in Alabama where he learned to fly Hueys. And he flew Hueys for five years. And um, at the end of the war, he was uh, thrown in a re education camp. And, um, and one day they finally just unexpectedly let him out. He went and was able to go home. But when he went home, he was not allowed to hold a job, and he had to check in with the police department once a month to let him know what he was doing. And um, they tried to escape Vietnam and boat and got caught, and that put him in worse position. And then when it, the way he got out of Vietnam was the United States had an agreement with North Vietnam that happened right around 1990. And it was between um, Ronald Reagan and the North Vietnamese, and it was Reagan wanted to get some of our um, allies out uh, out of um, imprisonment, and uh, so he was allowed. This family was allowed to get a visa, and um, for a boatload of money, you know, I'm sure for the U.S. it was never published how much was paid to the North Vietnamese, but. Uh, he was one of the ones that got a visa, and they were able to go to Thailand and borrow money from Catholic charities and fly from Bangkok to San Francisco, where they had relatives that had already made it there. And um, they made their life in the U.S. His son, John, met my daughter, Anna, at Cal Poly Pomona. They're both architecture students. And uh, they got married, and now I've got two half Vietnamese granddaughters. So after I got discharged, I went back to California State University of Los Angeles, got my mechanical engineering degree. Went back to racing, won four national championships in the 70s and uh, grand national champion in 1975. That's me on the left, making a pass on Steve O'Hare. Uh, then I went to work at McCulloch Corporation. That's the company that manufactured my racing engines. And I designed this chainsaw, the uh, Power Mac 300. Uh, I went to another company and designed an electric leaf blower. Went to Warner Communications and manufactured these uh, race cars, Malibu Grand Prix. And then the last part of my career was spent at Honeywell doing turbocharger development. The so last 15 years before I retired, I was the manager of motorsports engineering for Honeywell Turbo Technologies. We built custom racing turbos for uh, World Rally, this is Paris to Car, sports car racing, 24 Hours of Le Mans, Indy cars, uh, drag racing. Uh, and then this is a picture that was taken at Fontana at the California Speedway in about late 90s. And that was me talking to a couple of um, Penske engineers. Um, our company sponsored, we're a minor sponsor on Penske. You can see our logo here on his, on his slave, Turbo Garrett. And um, we provided them some free development of turbos and 
exchange for marketing stuff. And that's, uh, that's the end of my story. Outstanding presentation again, Doug. Thank you very much. Was it as good as the first time? How was the audio? Audio was fine. Okay, yes. Good. It was perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. So, Doug, how was the... You know, um, um, the reputation that we had was contrary to our experience in that, um, you know, Pete, when I... When I um, was assigned to recon and I went to supply to get my M16 issued. The supply sergeant, when he issued me my weapon, he said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to recon. And he said, oh, geez, I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> that's a, that's a bad, that's a bad unit. You know, that's, uh, that's a bunch of savages over there and the whole thing. And, and so I'm, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, oh God, what am I getting into here? And, uh, but what, you know, once we were in there, we, felt differently about it. And that was because being a reconnaissance platoon, um, our orders were, we're not supposed to seek out the enemy and engage them. We're supposed to seek out the enemy and, um, and report back and let the uh, line companies come in and engage the enemy. So um, we always felt like when we got dropped into the jungle somewhere, if we did a, some invasive moves to uh, shake the enemy so they didn't know where we were, uh, we could do a pretty good job of hiding. We felt pretty safe. I mean, it's a relative term, you know. We felt, we felt. Let's put it this way: we felt safer being a reconnaissance platoon, independent, in the jungle hiding, than we would have as a uh, as a line company doing search and destroy and blowing things up. Um, and so, um, and I, I certainly wouldn't have changed positions with somebody in a line company, and I think most of the recon guys don't. As far as morale, that's a hard question to answer because it's a day-to-day -day situation. Everybody's just thinking about today and uh, and not thinking ahead. I get a lot of questions in the school, you know, especially like at Chapman, you know, when you get to the university level, they want to know your political opinion and how you feel about how the war was orchestrated and all that. And, and it's it's like well that, you know it's an interesting question. They assume that we have we had at that time opinions about that, but we were we weren't thinking about any of that. We were just thinking about where am I today? How am I going to survive today? And um, so I don't know. The morale was was pretty decent. It seemed to me. I mean, but, given the situation. Yeah. It's, it's like I mean. It's not like you have options. I mean, it's like you have no, you're there. You have no options. I, you know, once in a while I'm asked at the schools about, you know, uh, how do you deal with fear and all that. And I, I tell them, you know, that one of the, the first day that I was, when I was supposed to get helicoptered out to my unit, I hadn't even met my recon unit yet. I was going with the supplies, you know, the food and the ammo and stuff as a human resource resupply. And, um, the uh, dispatcher came over to me and he said, uh, yeah, you can go back to the barracks and get a good night's sleep. You're not going anywhere today. Your, your, your platoon got ambushed today. Oh, yeah. oh. So when I went back, you know, it was a, that was a, probably my toughest night because I'm thinking I've got 340 something days to go and they're ambushed the very first day. How, how, how do I ever get through a year of this? And the answer that I came up with in my own mind was, you know, just take it one day at a time, don't think ahead. And remember that for every soldier that's killed, there's normally about five that are wounded. So you have a 5%, five times better chance of being wounded than killed. And then there's some that aren't wounded or killed. So, you know, your chances of living are better than your chances of dying. So I'm constantly telling myself that. You know, that my, I know my chances, and it's true, you know, my chances of living were better than my chances of dying, and that was the way I handled the fear. And um, unfortunately, the, you didn't have any choice about who died, because uh, you know, no matter how well you prepared, you couldn't prepare for the surprises, you know, the, the ambushes and all that kind of stuff. So it's mainly a mind game more than anything.
So when, when you're at uh, Fort Ord for AIT, so when you're doing maneuvers like the uh, line fire, uh, you know, fire in advance, I forget what they call that, and you're going up a hill that just has scrub brush, and now, so you have pretty good line of sight, but when now you go to the jungle, yeah. Well, so how did how did you adjust to that? Was that in your NCO class or? Um, they talked about it, but um, and you you practice in different conditions, but and until you're there, you it, it um, you kind of develop your. Uh, strategy, you know, your mental and your physical strategy um, at the time. There, there's a lot of, it makes so much difference to be in the real situation. And those uh, training things at Fort Benning, it, you know, they would, we had one deal, which was, we're going to practice you getting taken prisoner. So they had a, a, a mock prisoner of war camp, a, a Vietnamese one, and you're taken prisoner and you're trained, you know, just give your rank serial number and and what you're supposed to do and all that kind of stuff. But it, it's uh, of very little use if the real thing happens because you're not in the same metal, um, metal place. You know, I can't speak to that. We did take prisoners and we did have prisoners taken and uh, there's no preparation for it. You know, it's not really. Um, so I don't know. It's just it's basically you do all this training and then you throw everybody out there and and uh, see what you can what you can make out of it. I'm kind of surprised. You know, when I think back about it, I'm kind of surprised that the army didn't give any training on um, you know psychological uh, coping or uh, you know they just they just taught combat and. Uh, um, you know, but, but thank God we didn't have what the um, NBA had, which was political indoctrination. You know, they actually, yeah. uh, when I read the uh, book by the NBA soldier, he talked about that. The NBA soldiers hated the uh, political officers. You know, they'd come, they'd be, they'd be wiped out from combat in, a, in, in deep uh, PTSD. And this guy would show up with a book and start talking about uh, Karl Marx. And, you know, uh, he talks about that in his book and how, how they, they, he said they were not only hated by us, they were hated by our officer. And, and we hated them because they, they didn't have a home. They'd come around and then they'd expect to take up shelter in the trenches that we dug for ourselves. So they'd take up space and then they want us to feed them. <laughs> so I'm thinking, well, I'm glad we didn't have any of that aggregation. Yeah. Doug, uh, thank you for your service. Uh, great presentation. Uh, you say you were there for uh, a year? I was there eight and a half months. I, I went home to the hospital system. OK. And in that time, when you're in the jungle day after day, how you, you talked about fear a little bit, but did you get to a point where you just didn't worry about what was potentially going to happen in the next minute or the next hour or the next day? I mean, how how did how did you deal with with hey, you never know what's going to happen in the next minute? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yes, I did for large parts of time, but then there was um, specific incidents when I knew we were, you know, and and being threatened that, uh, you know, you all of a sudden you can't, you know, thinking about the fear. Um, but yeah, um, I didn't worry about it. I, I, I didn't worry about it too much because there wasn't anything I could do about it. And uh, um, now I can say this, that being a squad leader, I had members in my squad that didn't deal with the fear well at all. And um, I had one guy that, um, uh, one had a mental breakdown. That that, uh, that happened the day we arrived in Cambodia. One of the soldiers just um, he had a fit. He started swallowing his tongue, and, and he was sent he was sent back, obviously. And then I had another guy that um, he was 
very nervous and sure he was going to die and the whole thing. And we sent him back to see a psychiatrist in the rear. And we thought we would never see him again because he was in such a bad way. Four or five days later, they sent him back out on a helicopter. <laughs> mm. Well, he's, he's, uh, he's had some, uh, some counseling now. He's ready to go again, man. And, you know, it's occurred to me that those guys are the ones that are suffering the most from PTSD today. You know, they, they had it bad at the time, and, um, and uh, they've still got it bad. Well, again, thank you for your service. Yeah, you're welcome. Doug, that was an excellent presentation today. Thank you. If there, if there are any other questions, uh, please uh, ask your questions. How do you Otherwise, hat, how do you pass the hat, Scott, so you can put some money into the system? I saw I saw your email. We. Um, one of the yeah we are the income is is uh, zero. Uh, fortunately, we p uh, paid our rental at the church uh, in advance, 